Good evening, Mr. Fukuyama, and thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Simultaneous wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. I am sure that a few years ago, all of us would have described such a scenario as something of a nightmare. And yet we experience it. In retrospect, do you see possible mistakes in the strategy of the West that led to these conflicts? Or is it just the unruly nature of authoritarian regimes? Uh, in, in that case, I'm referring to Russia and Iran to the extent that it is associated with Hamas. Oh, I think there are certainly mistakes. I think the biggest one was with regard to Russia. Uh, I think if you had watched and listened to Vladimir Putin over the past 10 years, he's made very clear that he really wanted to uh, restore as much of the former Soviet Union as possible. And I think that in 2014, when he took over Crimea and the Donbass, uh, people didn't take it seriously. There were really no sanctions of any meaningful sort. Uh, the Obama administration actually refused to sell weapons to Ukraine uh, to meet that challenge. And I think if the response had been stronger then, uh, you possibly could have deterred Russia from doing the invasion in 2022. In the case of Hamas, I think, again, there were some major intelligence failures on the part of the Israelis. They actually believed that Hamas had been successfully contained. They were putting all of their uh, troops, you know, in the West Bank to protect settlers, which was, you know, a bad idea, just <laughs> however you look at it, uh, and in the North, and they didn't take the Gaza threat uh, seriously. So I think in both of those cases, you could have deterred those attacks potentially, but, uh, you know, there was a failure. In times like these, uh, people worry about the risk of uh, generalization of conflicts. Uh, some even fear a uh, World War III scenario. Uh, the calmer ones uh, consider that the balance of power remains in favor of the Western uh, democracies, something which acts as a safety net. Uh, what is your assessment? Uh, can things get out of hand? Oh, I, I think they can easily get out of hand. And that's, that's why this period, I think, is particularly worrisome. Uh, you have, you know, a great power competition that's been restored with active military engagement now uh, in Ukraine. But then you have all these other actors, you know, especially in the Middle East, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, all of which have slightly different interests and which are independently capable of triggering, you know, an escalation, an unwanted uh, escalation. Uh, and then you have both of these in, in, in Ukraine and, and uh, Gaza going on simultaneously. And then there's China waiting in the wings where they could take advantage of the distraction of the United States or of the West, you know, by these other conflicts. So I think we are in a, you know, a very, uh, uh, very tricky position right now where the conflict could escape the control of, of anyone. By the way, any comment on the initiative? of the students in Harvard to justify, in a way, Hamas actions? Well, I think that the response of the global left has really been terrible. Uh, I think that Hamas does not represent the interests of the Palestinian people. They have no interest in any kind of peaceful settlement with Israel. They never have. And for uh, progressive students to basically support this kind of a fanatical religious group, you know, it makes no ideological sense. A key factor for the outcome of the geopolitical developments is the role of the U.S. as a deterrent. In Europe, there are intense concerns uh, about the scenario of a Trump re-election, to the extent that this would mean the withdrawal of the USA from the focus of uh, geopolitical confrontations. What do you think? Well, I as an American am very worried about a Trump victory next year, and I think everybody else should be. Uh, he has completely departed from any kind of tradition of American internationalism. Uh, he's threatened to withdraw the United States from NATO. He is actually on the Russian side in the conflict with uh, Ukraine. And he's uh, really vowed in many ways to destroy a lot of important American institutions like the independence of the judiciary, the Justice Department. Uh, and I think that the impact of the Trump election on global democracy will be really devastating, given how important the U.S. has been both as a as a material player in, in global politics, but also as a source of inspiration for other democracies around the world. Is Biden too old to run? Should the Democrats have prepared an alternative against Trump? 
Well, I think many Democrats wish that he were 20 years younger, but I think it's at this point too late to consider, you know, replacing him with somebody else. I mean, he doesn't want to do that. He's made clear that he's running. Um, he's done a good job. Uh, unfortunately, his age is his biggest uh, vulnerability because a lot of Americans believe that he's uh, too old, despite the fact that I think um, in reality, he's actually been a pretty successful president. Um, and I think one of the big problems with his stepping back is that Kamala Harris, the vice president, is not popular and doesn't seem to be, you know, a good alternative. So I think for the time being, you know, Biden is the mm -hmm. Democrats' candidate. Lately, we're seeing a trade policy in the part of the U.S. that includes some elements of protectionism, uh, such as subsidies to U.S. industry and incentives to attract business from abroad, uh, even from Europe. Is Biden making America great again? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that he's continued a lot of the Trump tariffs. Uh, I think that this is not general protectionism because it really is directed towards certain strategic areas like semiconductors and, you know, electric vehicles, this sort of thing. Uh, it's not across the board, but it's still um, a dangerous policy because a little protectionism tends to grow into more protectionism. Uh, and also it's, it's achieving contradictory goals because on the one hand, he wants to speed up the transition to alternative energy. But on the other hand, he wants everything made in the United States. And sometimes, you know, those two goals uh, uh, conflict. Can liberal democracies remain unscathed in the face of the challenges posed by systematic waves of uh, refugees and migrants? And would you say that the immigration crisis has pushed the political center to the right? Well, it's definitely, the, the migration crisis has definitely uh, fueled the rise of populist nationalism in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a issue of principle because I do think that states benefit from immigration, but they also have a right as a sovereign democratic uh, collective to determine who goes into the country at what rate uh, and the like. And in both the U.S. and in Europe, uh, states have not been able to exercise that degree of control. And I think Europe has a particular problem because, you know, within the Schengen zone, you have free movement uh, by law, but that only works if you have secure outer borders. And Greece is one of those outer borders where, you know, you don't have a, a, a secure border. And therefore, a lot of the burden falls on Greece, on Italy, on Spain, on other uh, you know, routes for migrants. And so I think that, you know, uh, although I in general think that, you know, migration and asylum are good things to have, I also think that, you know, democracy demands a certain degree of control over those uh, functions. And one last thing. Why so much noise about artificial intelligence? Isn't it enough to agree that we just need to regulate and uh, supervise it, like most things in life? Um, well, I believe the uh, Economist editorialized that premature regulation of AI is not a good thing. And I tend to agree, you know, unlike blockchain, which I thought was kind of a fraud right from the beginning, uh, this generative artificial intelligence, I think, is a really big, important development. But we don't understand what the implications are. It's sort of like trying to predict what would be the effect of electricity at the time that Thomas Edison invented the first light bulb in the 1880s, you know, we couldn't possibly have foreseen the, the long-term consequences. So I do think it's premature to talk about regulating it. I think in principle, if there are real harms, it ought to be regulated, but it's too early to know what those are. And therefore, I think we should be a, a little cautious in jumping into, a, a, you know, some kind of a broad regulatory scheme for a technology that is A, going to be very transformative and B, you know, probably very beneficial in many ways. Thank you, Mr. Fukuyama. Thank you very much.